hello, everyone. I am very happy today to be here speaking with Bill Roeder, who is a really incredible basket weaver, maker, uh, gardener, <laughs> who um, is very painstaking in, in the work that he does um, and the complete cycle that it takes um, from growing the plants to harvesting to shaping the raw material to then taking that, that shaped raw material and turning it into his finished beautiful work. My name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm executive director of Bainbridge Arts and Crafts. <laughs> and um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bill. And uh, if you could give us some background about um, how you got into this and what drives you and the work that you make and your inspirations, uh, we would love to hear all about it. So take it away, Bill. <laughs> well, that's a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> uh, many years ago, many years ago, uh, I tied flies commercially, fishing flies. And Judy and I got together and we did shows together with her contemporary work and my fishing flies. And I got into basketry because one day we did a show in Kent and it was so slow and the light wasn't any good, so I couldn't tie flies. And so I ended up using her soft materials and making a basket. <laughs> and then from there, uh, uh, she gave me a gift to work with Hiro Yanazawa, one of the first times he was over here at the basket school. That led to a 30-year relationship with him doing bamboo. And for us taking Daddy. a group, pardon me? Did you study with him then, or? Oh, yeah, he, <clears throat> he would be up here five or six times a year, and we'd work together. And uh, then we took a group to Japan, uh, to his Japan, Beppu and the mountains there, <laughs> and met basket makers and what have you. And so that went on for, like I say, probably close to 30 years. <laughs> and not too long after I took the class down there, uh, Judy wanted me to go to Canada and work with Werner Chersky in Round Willow. So I went up to went up there to do that. That's where I was introduced to the German skating tool because in 1989 they had a big Willow symposium up there and Michael Cheersman from Germany brought a skating tool over and he left it with some friends. And so we stayed with those friends and I spent two nights making little pieces of willow. <laughs> and uh, so when I came home, I loved that. The preparation is great. So when I came back, I reground the angle on the Japanese knives and proceeded to drive those into blocks of wood like you do for bamboo and made skeins for Judy. <clears throat> and she, uh, she did a, uh, was invited to do an, an art show, a gallery, in the Amana colonies with Joanna Shantz, and she did two skein willow pieces. And those were probably the first two skein willow pieces in the United States. <laughs> and Joanna brought Alfred Snyder, the director of the National School in Lichtenfels, over to jury the show. And he was pretty amazed to see somebody doing skein willow. And so, long story, a uh, short part of that story actually is that. He felt that since she brought him over and they toured a bit, that he needed to do something in return. And I was one of the people that got to go to Germany in 2003 with Joanna and study with Alfred. And I had already been using my tools my way. I didn't have German techniques, but doing the German work. And he and I hit it off and became fast friends uh, since then, many times I went over and I stay in their house. Sometimes we work in the school. Uh, a lot of times just work in his little shop in the basement. And uh, I'll stay with him a couple weeks at a time. So that's where the, the actual willow got going. <clears throat> and then um, he had a stroke a few years ago and can't weave. And so the Herr Pop, who was the round willow instructor, who's also an expert skein willow basket maker, uh, took over. And so now I go back and work with him. 
Or, Do you mind yeah. explaining a little more about the skeining process? Um, was that developed in Germany originally? Uh, this particular type of work was, yes. And uh, it, it's rather interesting working with the Germans because, of course, it's, it's like everything else. It's very exacting. It's engineered, you know. <laughs> and so you, you basically raise a basketry willow of a type that doesn't branch. So uh, triandra, uh, Polish purple, these are, are kinds of, of willow that you can use, Americana to some extent. And so you harvest it in January. You generally put it in four inches of water. And in about April, when the bark begins to slip, it begins to grow, you peel it. And that's what the video that I, I sent you is about. And then you store it in a loosely bundled area preferably in the dark with good airflow for a year. And then it's totally dry and you can begin to make skeins. So in case anyone gets to see it, the other video I sent shows this process. You use a little wooden cleave. Angle on the top. And then you begin a three-way split from the center of it. We have a little tool called a cleave. You can see it has three blades. I'm going to cut this into three pie shaped pieces. You always want to stay right in the center. This happens to be an end, as you can see, has brown and stuff on it. It's not going to be used. I'm going to get rid of it. Then the next process is to both thin it and narrow it. One step at a time. So I'll put my thumb guard on so I don't get a bunch of slivers. So we start with the flat, or the flat side up, or the pith, so we're going to pull the pith out of it. So you just pull it out of the planer blade, nice and smooth. Once you get it down to a certain width, you want to narrow it. So I usually narrow it right after my first planing. So these are upright blades that you pull the willow through and <clears throat> it will make it uh, narrower so that you can actually get down the pretty small weeds. So one step at a time, you don't want to get greedy and take too much. We took quite a little bit there. Now I'll put it in the next slot and pull through it. And we try to pull so that you're getting willow off of both sides at once. That keeps the willow even. You don't have a thick edge and a thin edge. Got a little tangle up there. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I use this homemade bench to do the initial pulls because they're very tough and I don't want to misuse my little German benches that I made. <clears throat> then we come over to one of these benches and we're going to thin this down to make an actual weaver and stakes out of it. Some material you can really use. So again, you go through one and then the, the next to just keep sizing it little by little. If you get greedy and take too much, it gets rough or you break it or you cut it off. So you pull, you start with an end, which of course you can't pull, you know, you can't get the end through where you're going to cut it off. So you have to turn your material around and pull the end off that you started with. So now it's even in size. So we'll just go on down with this. If 
you don't have water, you put a little spit on your fingers, of course. <laughs> We'll go another one here. This would be a typical uh, piece of bracelet material in this thickness and the width that I'm going to do here. Again, you're trying to pull it off of both sides at once. And then with the German skein work, you get pretty fussy about widths, and so you have an adjustable one here. And we can go from, you know, 2.7 thousandths uh, or 2.7 uh, millimeters uh, to something that isn't one of these regular blades. So you pull through this portable one. There you have a, a weaver. Very nice. And you make three pie-shaped pieces out of that rod of willow. And then you use the planar blades and the upright blades and proceed to make all of your material. So it's a very, very intense process. And when I teach, we spend the first two hours trying to learn to prepare material because I teach in the German tradition which means uh, you will learn to make your own material. <laughs> you know, that's just how it is. And uh, so usually we spend the first two hours doing that. And then I always have some material prepared because everybody is frustrated by that point and they have a lot of 24 inch willow or less. And so they can use some of mine and begin to weave. And then you prepare a willow as you need it. You don't try to do 300 pieces for a basket at one time. So anyway, so you, you know, you alternate back and forth between the planar blades and the upright blades, and you make these skeins that you need. In, in Germany, if you go to the school, uh, they have about 3,000 molds because everything is woven over a mold. And they have about 3,000 in their storeroom. It's amazing. And some are 200 years old. And they were carved out with an axe. But if you, you know, if you don't have access to that, then you need a lathe and you need to know how to turn wood and you make your own molds. And uh, so anyway, it's, it's, you know, woven over a mold. <clears throat> the German tradition, there is no book about this. You're free to take notes, which they do in the school, lots of notes. But um, you really aggravate them if you're one of those people that gets their camera out every time somebody makes a move, you know. <laughs> so basically, you sit at your master's feet and you learn. And uh, uh, Alfred was very intense. Um, you know, like I say, he worked really hard. And Herr Pop was always a curmudgeon. And the students, when he took over the school, he used to say, oh, my God, don't sit next to the window. If he doesn't like your work, he'll throw it out. <laughs> oh, my. Which he didn't really do. They had screens on the window, but <laughs> knowing her pop, he might. <laughs> and now I work with him and come to find out he is not a curmudgeon. Uh, he raises show pigeons. He loves to garden. <laughs> and we just have a great time. And so, anyway, that's basically how I got started. And Herr Pop made all of the tools for the school. And these tools are not available, not over there, not here. You can't go buy them. Hmm. And he was gracious enough to make me six sets. Oh, wow. So I built the benches. He sent the knives over, mounted in the blocks. And um, so I get to teach. Alfred at one point said, you know, it's Germany, so it's like a trade. And you don't just you know, make three baskets and run out and start teaching. You wait until your instructor tells you, you should be teaching. <laughs> and, you know, then you go teach. How many years so did you put in before you got that vote of approval? <laughs> no, you, you just don't. 
Mm. And I really respect them. I mean, their abilities are phenomenal. And the tradition is, is just it's very set in stone. But if you follow the tradition, you will become a good basket maker one day. And it takes years. And um, so anyway, that was pretty much how I got started and what I do here. And so, yeah. Um, next to you, I see something that looks like a mold. Is that true? A wood tree <laughs> piece? <laughs> this? So you're starting a basket water. over that? Yeah, this is, this is uh, a mold that I made. It's a puzzle mold. Hmm. So the center comes out and the sides fold in because the shape of this, you can see, you couldn't get the mold out if, you, if it didn't come out in pieces. Right. And I have just finished the bottom on it, on this basket. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so and it's interesting, you know, you have to sit down and decide the sizes, the shapes and what have you, and, and develop the ability to make your own molds. So you turn the wood molds as well? Yeah. And the, there's some bundles behind you. Are those drying out like you described? Yes, that's just uh, the, basically the uh, remnants of this year's willow. Mm -hmm. uh, the bulk of it is in my wood shop and had already been, you know, uh, dry enough that it's not going to mold. And so it goes in there and I keep a fan on it year round. Uh, this is basically what was kind of left. So, uh, uh, yeah, these are these are Polish purple that we raise here. And then I bring willow over from France to a triandra. Hmm. And it's an extremely hard willow. This is this is what I use for teaching. It's a good basketry willow. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I use it for teaching because it's very forgiving. And it's not going to crack and stuff real easily. The triandra is very hard to pull through the knives. And uh, it, it's a little bit fussy. It has a tendency, if you don't treat it right, to crack or split down the middle or something. And needless to say, these baskets are not allowed to have imperfections. <laughs> so. They certainly look that way. <laughs> they they yeah. were stunning in their perfection and skill and technique involved. And um, the name of the school where you teach with your wife, Judy, that's Fish Sticks. Is that right? Yeah, she's not my wife. We've been together for many years. So oh. like yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, Fish Sticks Basketry. And you know, when the basket school was closing up in Seattle, we opened this and we hosted oh, as many as a dozen international teachers every year for many years. And uh, we taught here too. And so it, it's really been a fantastic thing for the Northwest because, you know, Judy teaches nationally and internationally. And bar none, the best basket makers in the United States come from the Northwest, hmm. especially when it comes to natural materials, barks and stuff. And, uh, I, you know, I feel like we both feel like we were very instrumental in the level of basketry and the knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that people got out here because we had the best come. And, you know, when you're, when you're learning from the best, automatically you're, and not only are you learning, you know, the proper techniques and all this and how to handle material, but it just elevates your work to begin with because you don't get bad habits, you know? And uh, so we were quite instrumental for many years in that. And then like everything else, it runs in cycles and, you know, interest started dwindling a bit and many of those people have been taking classes here for 10 years <clears throat> so uh you know and we were getting tired too <laughs> as i'm sure you're aware it's you know when you're arranging all the flights and everything involved with bringing people here and we've taken groups places to england and like i said japan 
uh, that's a lot of work too, but it, it really exposes people to what basketry is the world over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have been very lucky, uh, Judy too, uh, independently. She has worked with all of the people up in the Scandinavian countries <clears throat> many times. Uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, uh, she's taught over there. She'll be going back for a month next year to New Zealand where she's curating a show and giving talks and, you know, and she does that here too. So, yeah, it's, it's really been quite a life. <laughs> I had no idea it would end up this way. So. I know I love that about the crafts community in general. Yeah. Just the, I, it seems if, if you're in a community like that, like I'm, I'm involved with glass, and it's yeah. international in a similar way. Um, just the connections are so powerful and oh. the, the sharing of information is, is just so inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> All of that. So um, it's great that you guys have been able to, do this yeah. here in the Northwest. I, I'd love I to do need- class with you if you still <laughs> oh, Yeah, I just returned from six weeks in Slovakia. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, about three weeks ago I came back. What were and, you uh, doing there? All of those people use paper, mm. uh, much like uh, Judy was exposed two years ago in Thailand. They mm. ran out of materials over there. They couldn't get read. And um, uh, so in Thailand, they used telephone books <laughs> and, they, and they rolled the pages over a wire <laughs> and, you know, stuck them together for splicing. And she took a class actually from somebody. Well, in the Slavic countries, in the Eastern Europe, uh, everybody is doing paper. And my friend over there is absolutely amazing with paper. And so uh, uh, she made two skein willow baskets while I was over there. I had, I had a tool sent there <clears throat> and uh, willow from France sent down there uh, three years ago, right before COVID when I was over there, two years ago, I guess. And uh, so we made two baskets while I was there. And then <laughs> I tried my hand at paper. And I was really good at smoothing out the newspaper, getting the creases out and cutting it. I was, I excelled at that, <laughs> but rolling it, no way. <laughs> so anyway, so it- yeah, and those are the, you know, the oddball things that you get involved in, like you say. Um, Is it a hand finger motion that you need to perfect, like some kind of manual skill that you need to perfect? Uh, Yeah, attention and being able to coordinate the left hand, which is kind of just a lead hand and the right, which does the rolling Mm. and to keep it tight. I mean, she uses a wire that's about one sixteenth inch diameter. (laughs) And, um, you know, the newspaper is cut lengthways and so you started in an angle at one end, and so you end up making a 18 inch or 20 inch. Uh, basically, it looks like willow. Hmm. Uh, you know, when you paint them different colors, and they call it painting, but they dye them all different colors. Hmm. And um, she has worked up the means to make something that looks like old brick. I mean, that that in terms of color and texture and uh, so it's pretty amazing and I could not get the even tension full length of that piece I would end up just wrinkling the end and it would be loose I did about six of them and I said I worked so hard at cutting this up there's no way I'm going to ruin all of that (laughs) but anyway yeah next year when I'm over uh, I hope to go in August and I'd like to go to the Polish Festival, mm. which is going to be in Poznan now. And it's huge Willow Festival. Uh, Lichtenfels, the national German national school in Lichtenfels, for many years has had what's billed as the largest Willow Festival in the world. I don't think it is anymore. I think Poland's actually bigger. 
but it's pretty amazing. But you won't see much gain work. Nobody does that. Hmm. So, what was, an the, <laughs> what was the name of the um, woman in uh, Slovakia that you were working with? Oh, uh, Josefina Lukakova. Hmm. She's just a friend of mine, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's pretty interesting. Like I say, everybody over there, Czechoslovakia, uh, clear up to Latvia, uh, Slovenia, they're all using paper and they have for years. Mm -hmm. They don't have willow. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you try to buy something like reed over there, you can get it from Czechoslovakia, but it's expensive. It's difficult to get. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So they took what they have available, mm -hmm. and I don't know where that developed. She has no idea of the history, mm -hmm. and that's what they came up with, you know. And it's amazing. And they're strong, mm -hmm. and they use a type of shellac on them if they're going to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's more and more need to repurpose materials, so. I imagine yeah. it's what they had handy and well, <laughs> Mrs. Is the mother yeah. of invention. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like carrying a 60 pound sack of newspaper on the bus for two hours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh. But they all have various people throughout the country, their friends that together, you know, keep their newspapers for them. Uh -huh. and, uh, so anyway, so, but yeah, it, it was, um, interesting working with willow over there and uh like i say i'm fortunate enough to have an extra set of tools that i sent over there i took part of them and sent some of them and to have this willow supplier in france the triandra is a great willow very hard very difficult but it's a great willow for basketry so you can't use willow that has any branches or mm -hmm. big nodes on it uh, none of that's any good. Hmm. And uh, so it's you're pretty fussy about what you're going to use. Is it challenging to ship a natural material like that internationally? I, I'm curious with, you know, customs or um, controls over like bugs and things with a natural material. No. You, you don't have a trouble with that? No, not with the willow. And it depends where you ship from, where it goes through. Um, first of all, it's it's dry, mm -hmm. and that makes a huge difference. Mm. Uh, and so, if you, if anything live goes to JFK, you know it's going to take two weeks minimum mm -hmm. to get out of there, and it will be rotten or whatever. Uh, the willow is dry. And so I get Willow within five days of when it's sent out of France. Wow. <laughs> and sending it from France is better than sending from England because everything from England goes through JFK. And <laughs> JFK is just not a nice place, even for <laughs> anything dry. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. And uh, uh, so when, when I get Willow from France, yeah, it's five days. It's not a big deal. When you're going the other direction, you're going into New Zealand, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. uh, fumigation, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, uh, the lady that Judy works so much with over there handles all that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. If you send, well, right before COVID, uh, she had sent an entire gallery's worth of baskets over and materials. And then, of course, COVID hit, mm -hmm. and New Zealand shut down. And uh, so all of that is still over there. It'll be unboxed next April when she goes over. <laughs> but, yeah, fumigation, everything imaginable, imaginable to get into Australia or New Zealand. So Europe's not bad. Because, mm -hmm. so. yeah, I ran into some of that with some exhibitions I was involved in planning a few years ago, and it just seems yeah. like every country's a little different. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you, you learn, too, that uh, uh, you never send anything anyway except air freight. Hmm. And if you're sending back here DHLs, the top, 
If you're sending things over, it's horribly expensive. If you can get DHL, it's great, but otherwise FedEx because they will hand carry. Hmm. So, yeah, uh, I sent some stuff over the uh, small box, hand carried four hundred and fifty eight dollars. Hmm. And but it was hand carried, so you know they got it. Yeah. Because otherwise, half of it disappeared. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. Now, Germany's not quite as bad as some of the other countries. Germany, <laughs> I mean, they're civilized, you know. <laughs> oh. Huh. oh my God! I hope they don't hear that. But anyway. <laughs> but. Um. So the the pieces that you're giving us for the exhibition, can you tell us mm -hmm. a little more about those? Well, there's uh, what seventeen, I think. Mm. They range from bracelets, which are fairly popular over here mm -hmm. uh, mind you I don't most galleries are, are not interested in traditional work now mm. uh, color is a big thing you know <laughs> and needless to say skein willow comes in two colors either natural or buff as it's been boiled <laughs> and um, so and traditional uh, right now the cycle is definitely contemporary work Mm. And so, you know, you just grin and bear it. Uh, fortunately for me, I don't do it to sell it. I, I want to perfect what I do. Mm -hmm. And I love to have people see it. Um, so, yeah. So what you're seeing is everything from bracelets. Uh, I have a couple of small, about uh, three inch tall, very small vase shapes that will be involved. Uh, and right on up to, um, oh, one, <laughs> it's uh, about two and a half inches tall and two inches in diameter. And it took two weeks of really hard work to make. And I made it while I was in Germany. And it is one that Alfred looked at because of the four strand braid and said, oh, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> but, um, you know, so beautiful little piece. I've got a couple wall pieces, which are like platters that have a, a spiral. <laughs> and uh, they're quite attractive. And like I say, they're, you can set them down, but they're, they're really best viewed as a wall piece. And, you know, and it depends, too, if a, a collector or somebody that, that really appreciates these we have a gallery in the house, a small gallery room, and I put in specific lighting uh, that we could throw shadows and what have you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you guys are good at that. I'm sure some of that will be done, and uh, that's impressive. And so it really shows people what you can do with this plain, natural work, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I might just for the heck of it throw in the fact I have to boast a little bit. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't have the oval anymore that <clears throat> I would have put into this show, but uh, uh, I had a collector in Washington D.C. that uh, uh, got this one oval basket from me, a beautiful piece, and it's in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. Mm. And the way sure. they, <clears throat> yeah. And they had that on a pedestal by itself, and the way they lit it, oh my gosh, it was mm. just, you know, it looked like it was three times as big, <laughs> much more <laughs> intricate, you know, I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> Is but, that at the uh, Renwick Gallery, or? Pardon me? Was that at the Renwick? Renwick? Yeah. Yeah, it's in the Renwick, yeah. It's in the uh, archives now, mm -hmm. which, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting to have things I mean, like this. I told David, wow, really appreciate this opportunity because people get to see it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yourself, when you look at it from a picture, over and over, I get people saying, oh, where do you get that read? Because you know? <laughs> that is what it looks like, you know. <laughs> uh, like a really nice read. <laughs> So uh, I really look forward to having it on display. And, oh, uh, so do we. I've seen it in all sizes and shapes and, you know, everything that I've been able to turn them over for. So 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a it's a pretty broad selection. So there's a lot of different shapes. There's two lidded pieces. Mm-hmm. And needless to say, lidded pieces are difficult. Mm, yeah, uh, to match yeah, them to just so. <laughs> get everything to fit and uh, the weaving itself needs to match. Um, the traditional German techniques, uh, some of them were developed like the four rod or the four strand braid was really developed for skein willow. It isn't that you can't do it with something else, but no other material lends itself to giving you the texture that you should have. And so the willow, you know, longitudinally, the lengthways will move, the fibers will move. You take a piece of something like ash, they don't move. And so, you know, I have seen a piece of work done with four strand braid in ash. And yeah, it was nice, but it's it's cumbersome. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you'll see with the willow, it's amazing. And that's a very time-consuming technique to use. But the Germans developed it because the skein willow will do it. Mm-hmm. The three-strand braid, which you can do in a couple of different ways. Again, uh, there's a lot of movements to each stitch. And uh, it does a superb job, whether you're doing the finish side on the inside or the outside. And so there's there's some of these techniques that are really unique to this material and quite attractive. So. Would you say it's a combination of the flexibility the material gives and and the strength that's unique? Yeah, it is. It is so strong. Um, yeah, the, the vertical movement of it, being able the fibers to slide really is what allows the willow to do some of these really tight corners and weaves. Mm. So <clears throat> I'll tell you this little story. <laughs> right. When I built my wood shop, we had an open house <clears throat> and quite a number of people came to see the new wood shop. And um, afterwards, I had two buddies that back in my younger days, 10 years ago, uh, they stayed and we imbibed a little bit in some German beer. <laughs> and they kept egging me on how small a skein could I make. <laughs> and we measured it and it is a size of three aught silk. So it's what the doctor uses to sew you up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is unbelievably smooth. And if you take it <clears throat> and just run it across your lips for moisture, you can tie a tight knot in it and it won't break. Wow. That material is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, and this, when I started with this piece, I had no idea I was going to be going so far. But it was not an excellent piece of willow. It was a good piece, but not excellent. And so to actually get it down that far Mm -hmm. was just amazing. And I still have that little piece. I show it to you, but you wouldn't be able to see it anyway. (laughs) It's so funny. (laughs) You need a uh, microscope to look at. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my daughter uh, came by. She's an RN. And uh, she was here one time. and, And came out in the shop she has no interest in what we do here but oh. but came out and I showed that to her and she said you know that's thicker than some of what I use to sew people up <laughs> it is so thin uh-huh. <laughs> and I don't remember what the measurements are but everything that we do is measured in millimeters mm-hmm. or inch or hundreds of a millimeter and it's, it's amazing. You would not understand until you do this what a difference. Like when you need a weaver that needs to be 1.43 millimeters wide. If it's 1.53 wide, you will find it doesn't work well. Mm-hmm. Now, does it need to be 1.43? No, but 1.4, you know, 6 or 7. <laughs> um, and 
so you know when I'm in Germany working or it used to be when I was in Germany working with Pop and and with Snyder, they had all of these sizes figured out, <clears throat> and so you just did what they said. It's a big deal. And then you come home and you say, well, I just got done making this basket. I'm doing it again and it's not working, you know? Yeah. And so you go back and refer to your notes and get your micrometer out and really start working with it. And you begin to find over the years that when I make a new piece now, like this one I showed you here on this mold, I have to determine what the negative spaces are going to be um, you know so that it works out right because odd and even numbers of stakes all these things make a difference in what technique you use and then <clears throat> i will experiment with the sizing so i will make stakes that feel like okay they're they're good for this mold they wrap around it that's okay and then for a, a weaver to actually begin the weaving, I have to experiment. And sometimes I'll take a piece out two or three times. And I don't feel bad about that because if I didn't have all the experience that I have now, I'd be taking it out a lot more often than that. <laughs> so You mean undoing it? <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, and it, it really kind of stabs you in the heart when you, you know, you spend all this time with this piece of willow and you take it out and you have to throw it in the garbage because it's got all these pins in it, you know. <laughs> but it's uh, anyway. the joy and pain of such an exacting process, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You, you can achieve this greatness, but you suffer to get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and and I will I will say there are nights when you come out here. I weave every night from seven to ten, mm. and so I go to work for five to six hours in the morning. I come home and work the nursery in the afternoon, and then I come out here. Mm. And especially with the heat and stuff, uh, there are nights when your eyes just can't do it. You know, and no matter what you do, it's just not good. You know, so that's a time to have something like a bracelet that you can work on instead. Mm -hmm. And so you still get to weave, but you're not going to ruin a piece that you're going to put time in. This, if I worked eight hours a day on it, this piece that, that I showed you on that mold will take close to three weeks mm -hmm. to finish. Mm -hmm. So it's not a fast process. Mm -hmm. The little four inch round basket that I teach um don't mind me grabbing one of those i'll show you real oh quick. that'd be great so this is a beginning basket uh-huh where am i here there we are <laughs> so this is a beginning basket and this will take um, a class between five and a half and six days to make mm. and i will you know what i do i mean my job of course is to you know, to oversee the weaving and, and help in any way I can. And there are times when you do need to prep a little material because you see that one or two people aren't going to get done or they're having a frustrating time. Wednesdays are terrible days. Everybody's tired Wednesday. <laughs> but anyway, that's an aside. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, so I, I help in any way I can. And, of course, you, you're constantly advising them and looking at what they do. Make sure there isn't a mistake in it because you hate to tell them, oh, you got to take out four rows. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, so like I say, there's there's a lot of time and a lot of work involved in the, in the material. And preparation is like with so many things, I'm sure it's that way with glass. The preparation is 75% of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you don't prep well, it doesn't matter how you treat that material, you're not going to make a good basket. And prep is the hardest thing to learn. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I have a, a small following that we try to get together once a year. And uh, uh, I have taught, you know, like John Campbell Folk School and stuff. Mm -hmm. But most people are just not suited to do this. 
Mm-hmm. And I mean, unfortunately, that's that's just a fact because it's extremely intense. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you have glass work that is, yeah. Yeah. Some people are cut out to do it. That's I have a really good nice. friend from uh, South Carolina, uh, Mike Berenger. He he's a was a emergency room surgeon. And he went to Germany with me one year or two and worked in the school over there. And uh, uh, I remember at the school, the third day at the school on this project we were doing, Mike said, I have reached my limit. I won't be doing another class. <laughs> and I mean, he, he knew his hands. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, <clears throat> he said, it's like an eight hour surgery. Mm-hmm. You just can't relax. And he said, "You know, I don't do that anymore." <laughs> <laughs> but he had a great time, and and you know, we had a great time, and and uh, yeah, so so that happens. But uh, uh, we, you know, the the small group that I have, we all get together and we'll spend a week and really have a good time. Not easy to find the weeks anymore. Yeah, uh, Judy travels good four months of the year, sometimes mm. more. And uh, you know, with the heat in the nursery, you can't exactly leave anytime you want. In the winter, you get in snowpack and you gotta pull it off the greenhouses. In the summer, you need to water, and in the spring, you need to plant. <laughs> it's, it's a big commitment. <laughs> yeah. So this year, I uh, this is the longest I've ever gone. Usually uh, two weeks. Uh, two years ago, I went three weeks. And this time, I just booked the flight and said, I'm going for six weeks. <laughs> way I went. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. But you just can't do that all the time. So it really affects what I'm able to do here, too, because everybody has schedules and vacations and work. and Yeah. Yeah. So trying to get everybody together can be quite difficult. <laughs> anyway, we have a good time. and Anyway. <laughs> well, Bill, this has been really a wonderful insight into what you do and the just kind of the incredible dedication that's involved in this kind of work. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing some of your stories with us. Well, I enjoy that. Thank you. And education is, you know, 90% of what you do. And so being able to expose more people to Skane Willow, uh, have them really have some knowledge about it, it's just really important. And it makes me feel good. So That's what it's about. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll probably see you here at the gallery tomorrow. Um, I think you will, and, and no doubt in September. Great. Uh, You have a good rest of your day. You bet. You too. Thank you. Please join us in person to see Four Artists, Traditions and Process, featuring Karen Cornell, Bill Roeder, Karen Schminke, and Gail Tremblay, on view from September 2nd through October 2nd.